Fireside Tales for Wolfgang. Episode 50. Greetings and salutations. I'm Hunter Ackerman, here to read some classic literature for you. <laughs> it's from Henry David Thoreau. Um, <clears throat> I've done a couple of excerpts from Walden in the past. And it always helps me get um, focused, centered, grounded. I'm not sure what you would call it. Sometimes it helps me just sort of reprioritize and put things uh, back in the right order of how they fit into my life. Fireside Tales for Wolfgang. Originally broadcast on GWC Productions' YouTube channel, Caps Media Television Channel 6 in Ventura on KPPQ LP Ventura at 104.1 FM and on the KPPQ Podcast Network. Episodes can also be viewed on Pasadena Media either on Spectrum Charter Channel 32 or on AT&T Uverse Channel 99. This evening's uh, abridged excerpt is from the eighth chapter of Walden called The Ponds by Henry David Thoreau. Sometimes, having had a surfeit of human society and gossip and worn out all of my village friends, I rambled still farther westward than I habitually drill into the yet more unfrequented parts of the town, to fresh woods and pastures new, or while the sun was setting, made my supper of huckleberries and blueberries on Fairhaven Hill, and laid up a store for several days. The fruits do not yield their true flavor to the purchaser of them, nor to him who raises them for the market. There's but one way to obtain it, yet if you take that way, if you would know the flavor of huckleberries, ask the cowboy or the partridge. It is a vulgar error to suppose that you have tasted huckleberries who never plucked them. A huckleberry never reaches Boston. They have not been known there since they grew on her three hills. The ambrosial and essential part of the fruit is lost with the bloom, which is rubbed off in the market cart, and they become mere provender. As long as eternal justice reigns, not one innocent huckleberry can be transported thither from the country's hills. Occasionally, after my hoeing was done for the day, I joined some incomplete impatient companion who had been fishing on the pond since morning as silent and motionless as a duck or a floating leaf. And after practicing various kinds of philosophy, had concluded commonly by the time I arrived that he belonged to the ancient set of Cenobites. This, by the way, just as a side note, Cenobites were a monastic tradition that um, stressed community life. There was one older man, an excellent fisher and skilled in all kinds of woodcraft, who was pleased to look upon my house as a building erected for the conveniences of fishermen. And I was equally pleased when he sat in my doorway to arrange his lines. Once in a while, we sat together on the pond, he at one end of the boat and I at the other, but not many words passed between us, for he had grown deaf in his later years. But he occasionally hummed a psalm which harmonized well enough with my philosophy. Our communication was thus altogether one of unbroken harmony far more pleasing to remember than if it had been carried on by speech. When, as was commonly the case, I had none to commune with, I used to raise the echoes by striking with a paddle on the side of my boat, 
filling the surrounding woods with circling and dilating sound, stirring them up as the keeper of a menagerie, his wild beasts, until I elicited a growl from every wooded vale and hillside. In warm evenings, I frequently sat in the boat playing the flute and saw the perch, which I seemed to have charmed, hovering around me and the moon traveling over the ribbed bottom, which was strewn with the wrecks of the forest. Formerly, I had come to this pond adventurously from time to time in a dark summer nights with a companion and made a fire close to the water's edge. When we had done, we threw the burning brands high into the air like sky rockets, which coming down into the pond were quenched with a loud hissing and we were suddenly groping in total darkness. Through this, whistling a tune, we took our way to the haunts of people again. But now, I had made my home by the shore. Sometimes I've returned to the woods and spent the hours of midnight fishing from a boat by moonlight, serenaded by owls and foxes, and hearing from time to time the creaking note of some unknown bird close at hand. His experiences were very memorable and valuable to me. Anchored in 40 feet of water, surrounded sometimes by thousands of small perch and shiners dimpling the surface with their tails in the moonlight and communicating by a long flaxen line with mysterious nocturnal fishes which are their dwelling 40 feet below. At length, you slowly raise, pulling hand over hand some horned pout squeaking and squirming to the upper air. It was very queer, especially in the dark nights when your thoughts had wandered to vast and cosmological themes in other spheres, to feel this faint jerk which came to interrupt your dreams and link you to the immediacy of nature again. It seemed as if I might next cast my line upward into the air, as well as downward into the element, which was scarcely more dense. Thus, I caught two fishes, as it were, with one hook. The scenery of Walden is on a humble scale, and though very beautiful, does not approach to grandeur, nor can it much concern one who has not long frequented it or lived by its shore yet. This pond, this pond is so remarkable for its depth and purity as to merit a particular description. It is a clear and deep green well, half a mile long and a mile to three quarters in circumference and contains about 61 and a half acres. A perennial spring in the midst of pine and oak woods without any visible inlet or outlet except by the clouds and evaporation. All our Concord waters have two colors at least. One, when viewed at a distance, and another, more proper, close at hand. The first depends more on the light and follows the sky. In clear weather, in summer, they appear blue at a little distance, especially if agitated. And at a great distance, all appear alike. In stormy weather, they're sometimes of a dark slate color. The sea, however, is said to be blue one day and green another without any perceptible change in the atmosphere. I've seen our river when the landscape being covered with snow, both water and ice were almost as green as grass. Some consider blue to be the color of pure water, whether liquid or solid. But 
looking directly down into the waters from a boat. They're seen to be of very different colors. Walden is blue at one time and green at another, even from the same point of view. Lying between the earth and the heavens, it partakes of the color of both. The water is so transparent that the bottom can easily be discerned at the depth of 25 or 30 feet. Paddling over it, you may see many feet beneath the surface, the schools of perch and shiners, perhaps only an inch long. Once in the winter, many years ago, when I had been cutting holes through the ice in order to catch pickerel, as I stepped ashore, I tossed my axe back onto the ice, but as if some evil genius had directed it, it slid four or five rods directly into one of the holes where the water was 25 feet deep. Out of curiosity, I lay down on the ice and looked through the hole until I saw the axe a little on one side standing on its head with its half erect and gently swaying to and fro with the pulse of the pond. And there it might have stood erect and swaying till in the course of time the handle rotted off if I had not disturbed it. Making another hole directly over it with an ice, ice chisel, which I had, and cutting down with my knife the longest birch which I could find, I made a slip noose which I attached to its end, and letting it down carefully, I passed it over the knob of the handle and drew it by a line along the birch, and so pulled the axe out again. It's very clever of him. <clears throat> the shore is composed of a belt of smooth, rounded white stones, like paving stones, excepting one or two short sand beaches, and is so steep that in many places a single leap will carry you into water over your head, and were it not for its remarkable transparency, that would be the last to be seen of its bottom till it rose on the opposite side. Some think it is bottomless. It is nowhere muddy and a casual observer would say that there were no weeds at all in it, and of noticeable plants, a closer scrutiny does not detect a flag, nor a bulrush, nor even a lily, yellow or white, but only a few small heart leaves and pond weed, and perhaps a water target or two, which are clean and bright like the element they grow in. The stones extend a rod or two into the water, and then the bottom is pure sand, except in the deepest parts, where there is usually a little sediment, probably from the decay of leaves which have been wafted onto it, and a bright green weed is brought up on the anchors even in midwinter. We have one other pond just like this. White Pond, about two and a half miles westerly. But though I'm acquainted with most of the ponds within a dozen miles of this center, I do not know a third of this pure, well-like character. Yet, perchance, the first who came to this pond have left some trace of their footsteps. I've been surprised to detect encircling the pond even where a thick wood has just been cut down on the shore, a narrow shelf-like path in the steep hillside, alternately rising and falling, approaching and receding from the water's edge, as old, probably, as the race of man here, worn by the feet of aboriginal hunters and still from time to time unwittingly trodden by the present occupants of the land. Walden Pond rises and falls, but 
whether regularly or not, and within what period, nobody knows. Though, as usual, many pretend to know. It is commonly higher in the winter and lower in the summer, though not corresponding to the general wet and dryness. The same is true, as far as my observation goes, of White Pond. Some have been puzzled to tell how the shore became so regularly paved. My townsmen have all heard the tradition. The oldest people tell me that they heard it in their youth, that Anciently, the Indians were holding a powwow upon a hill here, which rose as high into the heavens as the pond now sinks deep into the earth. And they used much profanity, as the story goes, though this vice is one of which the Indians were never guilty. And while they were thus engaged, the hill shook and suddenly sank. And only, only one old squaw named Walden escaped. And from her, the pond was named. It has been conjectured that when the hill shook, these stones rolled down its side and became the present shore. It's very certain, at any rate, that once there was no pond here, and now there is one. As for the stones, Many still think that they are hardly to be accounted for by the action of the waves on these hills, but I observe that the surrounding hills are remarkably full of the same kind of stones, so that they have been obliged to pile them up in walls on both sides of the railroad cut nearest the pond. And moreover, there are most stones where the shore is most abrupt, so that, unfortunately, it is no longer a mystery to me. I detect the paver. <laughs> One might suppose that it was originally called a walled-in pond. The shiners pouts and perch also, and indeed all the fishes which inhabit this pond are much cleaner, handsomer, and firmer fleshed than those in river and most other ponds, as the water is purer and they can easily be distinguished from them. Probably, many ichthyologists would make new varieties of some of them. There are also a clean race of frogs and tortoises and a few mussels in it. Muskrats and minks leave their traces about it, and occasionally a traveling mud turtle visits it. Sometimes, when I pushed off my boat in the morning, I've disturbed a great mud turtle which had secreted itself under the boat in the night. Ducks and geese frequent it in the spring and fall. The white-bellied swallows skim over it, and the, the peetweets teeter along its stony shores all summer. I've sometimes dis disturbed a fish hawk sitting on a white pine over the water. I doubt if it is ever profaned by the wing of a gull like Fairhaven Pond. At most, it tolerates one annual loon. These are all the animals of consequence which frequent it now. You may see from a boat in calm weather near the sandy eastern shore where the water is eight or ten feet deep, some circular heaps half a dozen feet in diameter by a foot in height consisting of small stones, each less than a hen's egg in size, where all around is bare sand. At first, you wonder if the Indians could have formed them on the ice for any purpose, and so when the ice melted, they sank to the bottom. But they're too regular, and some of them plainly too fresh for that. They're similar to those found in rivers, but as there are no suckers nor lampreys here, I know not by what fish they could be made. These lend a pleasing mystery to the bottom. The shore is irregular enough not to be monotonous. The forest has never so good a setting, nor is it so distinctly beautiful as when seen from the middle of a small lake amid hills which rise from the water's edge. For the water in which it is reflected not only makes the best foreground in such a case, 
but with its winding shore, the most natural and agreeable boundary to it. There, nature has woven a natural selvage in the eye that rises from the low shrubs of the shore to the highest trees. There are few traces of man's hand to be seen. The water washes the shore as it did a thousand years ago. A lake, a lake is the landscape's most beautiful and expressive feature. It is the earth's eye looking into which the beholder measures the depth of his own nature. The fluvatile trees next to the shore are the slender eyelashes which fringe it, and the wooded hills and cliffs all around are its overhanging brows. Standing on the smooth, sandy beach at the east end of the pond, in a calm September afternoon, when a slight haze makes the opposite shoreline indistinct, I have seen whence came the expression, the glassy surface of a lake. When you invert your head, it looks like a thread of the finest gossamer stretched across the valley gleaming against the distant pine woods, separating one stratum of the atmosphere from another. You would think that you could walk dry under it to the opposite hills and that the swallows which skim over might perch on it. As you look over the pond westward, it is literally as smooth as glass, except where the skater insects, by their motions in the sun, produced the finest imaginable sparkle on it. Or perhaps a duck plumes itself, or a swallow skims so low as to touch it. It may be that in the distance, a fish describes an arc of three or four feet in the air, and there's one bright flash where it emerges and another where it strikes the water. Sometimes the whole silvery arc is revealed, or here and there, perhaps is a thistle-down floating on its surface, which the fishes dart at and so dimple it again. From a hilltop, you can see a fish leap in almost any part, for not a pickerel or a shiner picks an insect from this smooth surface, but that this disturbs the equilibrium of the whole lake. It is a soothing employment on one of those fine days in the fall when all the warmth of the sun is fully appreciated to sit on a stump overlooking the pond and study the dimpling circles which are incessantly inscribed on its otherwise invisible surface amid the reflected skies and trees. Over this great expanse, there is no disturbance, but it is thus at once gently smoothed away. The trembling circles seek the shore, and all is smooth again. How peaceful the phenomena of the lake. Aye, every leaf and twig and Stone and cobweb sparkles now at mid-afternoon as when covered with dew in a spring morning. Every motion of an oar or an insect produces a flash of light, and if an oar falls, how sweet the echo. In such a day, in September or October, Walden is a perfect forest mirror sit round with stones as precious to my eye as if rare. Nothing so fair, so pure, lies on the surface of the earth. Sky, water, 
It needs no fence. A field of water betrays the spirit that is in the air and is continually receiving new life and motion from above. It is intermediate in its nature between land and sky. On land, only the grass and trees wave, but the water itself is rippled by the wind. I see where the breeze dashes across it by the streaks of light. It is remarkable that we can look down on its surface. The skaters and water bugs finally disappear in the latter part of October when the severe frosts have come. And then, and in November, usually, in a calm day, there's absolutely nothing to ripple the surface. One November afternoon, in the calm at the end of a rainstorm of several days' duration, when the sky was still completely overcast and the air was full of mist, I observed that the pond was remarkably smooth, so that it was difficult to distinguish its surface, though it no longer reflected the bright tints of October, but the somber November colors of the surrounding hills. Though I passed over it as gently as possible, the slight undulations produced by my boat extended almost as far as I could see and gave a ribbed appearance to the reflections. But as I was looking over the surface, I saw here and there, at a distance, a faint glimmer, as if some skater insects which had escaped the frosts might be collected there, or perchance the surface being so smooth betrayed where a spring welled up from the bottom. Paddling gently to one of these places, I was surprised to find myself surrounded by myriads of small perch, about, about five inches long, of a rich bronze color in the green water, sporting there and constantly rising to the surface and dimpling it, sometimes leaving bubbles on it. And such transparent and seemingly bottomless water reflecting the clouds, I seemed to be floating through the air as in a balloon. And their swimming impressed me as a kind of flight or hovering, as if they were a compact flock of birds passing just beneath my level on the right or left of their fins like sails set all around them. There were many such schools in the pond, apparently improving the short season before their winter would draw an icy shudder over their broad skylight, sometimes giving to the surface an appearance as if a slight breeze struck it or a few raindrops fell there. When I, pro when I approached carelessly and alarmed them, they made a sudden splash and rippling with their tails, as if one had struck the water with a brushy bow and instantly took refuge in the depths. At length, the wind rose, the mist increased, and the waves began to run. And the perch leaped much higher than before, half out of the water, a hundred black points three inches long, at once above the surface. Even as late as the 5th of December one year, I saw some dimples on the surface, and thinking it was going to rain hard immediately, the air being full of mist, I made haste to take my place at the oars and row ho homeward. Already the rain seemed rapidly increasing, though I felt none on my cheek, and I anticipated a thorough soaking. But suddenly, the dimples ceased, for they were produced by the perch, 
which the noise of my oars had seared into the depths, and I saw their schools dimly disappearing. So I spent a dry afternoon, after all. An old man who used to frequent this pond nearly 60 years ago, when it was dark with surrounding forests, tells me that in those days he sometimes saw it all alive with ducks and other waterfowl, and that there were many eagles about it. Here, he came here a fishing and used an old log canoe, which he found on the shore. It was made of two white pine logs dug out and pinned together and was cut off square at the ends. It was very clumsy, but lasted a great many years before it became water and perhaps sank to the bottom. He did not know whose it was. It belonged to the pond. An old man, a potter, who lived by the pond before the revolution, told him once that there was an iron chest at the bottom and that he had seen it. Sometimes it would come floating up to the shore, but when you went toward it, it would go back into deep water and disappear. <laughs> the thought of Walden Pond having its version of a Loch Ness Monster, but that the Loch Ness Monster is really just an iron chest that you can never quite get your hands on. Kind of like a leprechaun's pot of gold forever at the end of a rainbow that you'll never be able to reach. When I first paddled a boat on Walden, it was completely surrounded by thick and lofty pine and oak woods, and in some of its coves, grapevines had run over the trees and formed bowers under which a boat could pass. The hills which form its shores are so steep, and the woods on them were then so high that as you looked down from the west end, it had the appearance of an amphitheater for some kind of sylvan spectacle. Oh, God, I love that term, an amphitheater for some kind of sylvan spectacle. I've spent many an hour when I was younger floating over its surface as the zephyr willed, having paddled my boat to the middle and lying on my back across the seats in a summer forenoon, dreaming awake until I was aroused by the boat touching the sand. And I rose to see what shore my fates had impelled me to. Days when idleness was the most attractive and productive industry. Many a forenoon have I stolen away preferring to spend thus the most valued part of the day. For I was rich, if not in money, in sunny hours and summer days, and spent them lavishly. Nor do I regret that I did not waste more of them in the workshop or the teacher's desk. But since I left those shores, the woodchoppers have still further laid them waste. And now, for many a year, there will be no more rambling through the aisles of the wood with occasional vistas through which you see the water. My muse may be excused if she is silent forthwith. How can you expect the birds to sing when their groves are cut down? Nevertheless, of all the characters I have known, perhaps Walden wears best and best preserves its purity. It has not acquired one permanent wrinkle after all its ripples. It is perennially young, 
and I may stand and see a shallow dip to pick an insect from its surfaces of yore. It struck me again tonight, as if I had not seen it almost daily for more than twenty years. Why, here is Walden, the same woodland lake that I discovered so many years ago. It is no dream of mine to ornament a line. I cannot come nearer to God and heaven than I live to Walden even. I am its stony shore and the breeze that passes o'er. In the hollow of my hand are its water and its sand and its deepest resort lies high in my thought. The cars never pause to look at it, yet I fancy that the engineers and firemen and brakemen and those passengers who have a season ticket and see it often are better men for the sight. The engineer does not forget at night that he has beheld this vision of serenity and purity once at least during the day. Flint's, or Sandy Pond, in Lincoln, our greatest lake and inland sea, lies about a mile east of Walden. It is much larger, being said to contain 197 acres, and is more fertile in fish, but it is comparatively shallow and not remarkably pure. A walk through the woods thither was often my recreation. It was worth the while, if only to feel the wind blow in your cheek freely and see the waves run. I went a chestnutting there in the fall, on windy days when the nuts were dropping into the water and were washed to my feet, the fresh spray blowing in my face. I used to admire the ripple marks on the sandy bottom at the north end of this pond, made firm and hard to the feet of the wader by the pressure of the water, and the rushes which grew in waving lines as if the waves had planted them. There also I have found in considerable quantities curious balls, composed apparently of fine grass or roots of pipe warp, perhaps, from half an inch to four inches in diameter, and perfectly spherical. These wash back and forth in shallow water on a sandy bottom and are sometimes cast on the shore. They are either solid grass or have a little sand in the middle. At first, you would say that they were formed by the action of the waves, like a pebble. Yet the smallest are made of equally coarse materials, half an inch long, and they are produced only at one season of the year. Moreover, the waves, I suspect, do not so much construct a material as they wear down a material. <laughs> Flint's Pond. Yeah, such is the poverty of our nomenclature. Rather, let it be named from the fishes that swim in it, the wild fowl or the animals which frequent it, the wild flowers which grow by its shores, or some wild man or child, the thread of whose history is interwoven from its own, not from him who could show no title to it but the deed which a like-minded neighbor or legislature gave him. Him who regretted only that it was not English hay or cranberry meadow, there was nothing to redeem it, forsooth, in his eyes, and would have drained it and sold it for the mud at its bottom. It did not turn his mill. It was no privilege for him to behold it. Goose Pond, a small pond, is on my way to Flint's. 
Fairhaven Pond is an expansion of Concord River. It's said to contain some 70 acres, and White Pond, of about 40 acres, is a mile and a half beyond Fairhaven. This, this is my lake country. These, with Concord River, are my water privileges. And night and day, year in, year out, they grind such grist as I carry to them. Perhaps the most attractive, if not the most beautiful, of all the lakes, the gem of the woods is White Pond. A poor name from its commonness, whether derived from the remarkable purity of its waters or the color of its sands. In these, as in other respects, however, it is a lesser twin of Walden. They're so much alike that you would say they must be connected underground. It has the same stony shore and its waters are of the same hue. As at Walden, in sultry weather, looking down through the woods on some of its bays, which are not so deep, but that the reflection from the bottom tinges them, the waters are of a misty bluish green. This pond has rarely been profaned by a boat, for there's little in it to tempt a fisherman. Instead of the white lily, which requires mud, or the common sweet flag, the blue flag, iris versicolor. This is a outdated or technical name for a blue iris. Iris versicolor grows thinly in the pure water, rose, rising from the stony bottom all around the shore where it's visited by hummingbirds in June and the color both of its bluish blades and its flowers and especially their reflections are in singular harmony with the sea green water. White Pond and Walden are great crystals on the surface of the earth, lakes of light. If they were permanently semi-solid and small enough to be clutched, they would perchance be carried off like precious stones to adorn the heads of emperors, but being liquid and ample and secured to us and our successors forever, we disregard them and run after the the great diamond of Kohinoor. How much more beautiful are they? Nature has no human inhabitant who appreciates her. The birds with their plumage and their notes are in harmony with the flowers, but what youth or maiden conspires with the, the wild luxuriant beauty of nature. She flourishes most alone, far from the towns. And now for Ask Hunter Anything, where I answer questions submitted by you, the viewers. Uh, please know that these episodes are live streamed on the Hunter's Acoustic Cabin YouTube channel every Monday evening at 9 o'clock California time uh, before they're made into this broadcast version. So you may hear reference to those who um, chat with me during my answers. And uh, hey, if you have a question that uh, you would like answered on Fireside Tales for Wolfgang, email me using the email address askhunteranything at gmail.com. It's just a life's hobby, passion, ambition, whatever you want to call it of mine. I'm just a really big fan of really good questions. Spent my entire life cultivating the best questions that I could possibly find. And I'd like to hear what questions that you have that you'd put into that category. Um, so basically Christina's question uh, was, uh, falls under what you would call meteorology, science of the weather. Um, Christina wanted to know, why is it that here in Southern California, 
we have really dry summers. Like it'll go a whole summer sometimes without raining, maybe literally without raining once. Maybe it will rain only once and very lightly at that. Then all of a sudden winter kicks in and snow or rain, depending on what altitude where you are in elevation, rather. Um, all of a sudden when winter kicks in, precipitation starts happening. What's up with that? Well, um, <laughs> well, Christina, uh, the answer uh, is describable. You're going to love this because the answer is, uh, uh, is, is, is named for its relationship to, um, to Italy. It's because Southern California is what we call a Mediterranean climate. So this is a high pressure zone through the warm months of the year. And what I mean by a, a high pressure zone is that um, in, in some spaces of air, if you want to put it this way, the air in some areas, uh, the pressure might be high. Like if you imagine the air inside a balloon, if your fingers come off of the opening of that balloon, let's say that the balloon's not tied, you know, it's got like an opening uh, in it that you're just holding closed with your fingers. If you let uh, your fingers off of that opening and just let the balloon do what it does, or rather let the air inside the balloon do what the air inside the balloon does, the moment that you give it the opportunity, that air is going to release from the balloon because the air inside the balloon is high pressure. And it's gonna go from a state of high pressure to low pressure, the exact that same way that water is going to fall from high places down to lower places, or that a ball is going to roll down a hill going from a high place to a lower place. So to give you another little insight on what I mean by high pressure area is go back to our balloon for a moment. To get more air inside that balloon, you're going to have to, to put more pressure in. Now our lungs are strong enough in comparison to how strong a balloon is pushing outward that our, long, our lung, lungs are generally strong enough to put more air into that balloon. But this is, again, just to kind of illustrate what I mean by a high pressure situation inside the balloon. You got to put effort through your lungs into putting more air into that balloon. And to give you an example of uh, the other side of the equation, a low pressure situation, this would be like a vacuum. So if you imagined having a, um, a bell jar, having an upside down piece of glass that had a hole in the bottom of it, and you've got a motor that is actively sucking the air out of that hole. The moment that you picked up the upside down jar, you're gonna let air in and air is gonna rush inside to fill the vacuum. This is a very low pressure situation, all right? So, a Mediterranean climate, such as we have here in Southern California, is a high pressure situation through the warm months. And as such, it's constantly um, got an outward pressure. So for um, clouds, for example, for rain bearing clouds to come into this situation is rather difficult because this is like trying to put air back inside a balloon. This is trying to put more air into a balloon. As a consequence, we always have this um, wind that is blowing out toward the ocean. And that is why I like living near the beach when I'm not up in Big Bear, for example, is because as polluted as the San Fernando Valley may become, Anywhere around the beach, at least through the warm summer months, there is this constant breeze pushing all the smog and the air pollution out onto the ocean, which is awful, but it is pushing the air pollution away from where I 
stand, live, and breathe. And uh, so, you know, if you're going to live in Southern California, the air is cleaner. Going to the air is cleaner by the beach. The moment we get into winter, this is when we go from a high pressure system to a low pressure system, just like in the Mediterranean. And when Southern California becomes a low pressure situation, this is where now the rain clouds, for example, are going to rush in very much like our upside down jar that we had pumped all the air out of, where all the air is now running, rushing inside this, uh, this, this vacuum jar. Now we're in a low pressure situation and a lot of rain bearing clouds or snow bearing clouds can suddenly come into the area and release precipitation upon us. And another Ask Hunter Anything question. Remember, you can submit your questions too by using the email address askhunteranything at gmail.com. JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, is positioning itself. Yes, um, uh, I concur. When uh, I was looking for an updated status report right before the beginning of the show, um, they were at a, they were about, we're about 30% of the way toward where it's going to, where it's going to be. Uh, you can't say where it's going to land and you can't say where it's going to stay because it's in a constant uh, rotational orbit around the sun. Um, so the, the sun earth position that it is traveling to, uh, I've described this previously on the show, this is uh, called the uh, uh, Lagrange point number two, L2 point. And um, essentially this is a spot that is about a million miles away from the earth. Um, I gave the contrast before that the Hubble telescope, the Hubble telescope is orbiting around the Earth. The James Webb telescope is going to be orbiting around the Sun. And the James Webb telescope is a lot farther out from the Hubble. The Hubble is typically around 250 miles above the Earth's surface, sometimes a little higher, sometimes a little lower. Uh, this thing is going to be about a million miles above the Earth's surface. It was about 30% of, of its voyage there. So there are three programmed burns that are going to be happening mid-flight. And when I say burns, I mean adjustment, course correction, where they fire up the rockets and kind of repoint, re-aim, reorient uh, the JWST. And uh, as Nick Davila correctly and accurately pointed out, um, it's right now in the second of the pre-planned burns. Um, so these burns uh, are not necessarily to make it, uh, th these burns are, are just like to aim it a little bit better. Left, right, up, down, where do, where do we need to go? Let's just like re-point, reorient, are we on track? And right now the second of three course corrections is happening. Um, and yes, David, it'll roughly stay put relative to the Earth. Roughly indeed. I just got the best visualization for this. Uh, this afternoon. Imagine a really, really whippy antenna. You remember when cars had antennae? Uh, imagine, like, say, a, um, a very long, and I'll say again, whippy rod. It's thick at the bottom in your hand, and the end, you can swish it through the air. And when you swish it this way, 
it's going to, when you switch it, forgive me, there are some people that are only listening to an audio that cannot uh, see a feed of this. Uh, if you flick it to your left, the reed in your hand will overbend farther to the left. You flick it then to the right, it'll overbend the other way. Uh, you could imagine this if you just like say, uh, straighten out a coat hanger and imagine whipping a coat hanger back and forth in your hand how um, it's, it's, it's never going to be a completely straight line. It's always going to be in some course correcting bend or wave. That's what the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be doing in relation to the sun and the earth and the JWST. Sometimes it'll be um, in, in my previous descriptions, it sounded uh, like it's going to always just be in a perfect fixed straight line. Well, sometimes it's going to be a little bit behind the Earth as the Earth is orbiting around the sun. Sometimes it's going to overcorrect and be a little bit in front of. It'll similarly go a little bit above and below that plane. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the L2 Lagrange points, um, and the, 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 J's, the, the JWST also has corrective rockets, uh, well, corrective thrusters on board to keep it in the, the area that it needs to be. But, yeah, it's going to be um, uh, more or less in a line with the sun, the earth, the James Webb Space Telescope. Nick is saying, as I understand, it will keep pace with the Earth. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, again, if you want to uh, just, just picture in your mind, and I'm going to try to use as few hand gestures uh, in this description as possible for the benefit of folks that are listening to the audio only. If you imagine in your mind uh, the sun as being a central pivot point, that for the purpose of this answer, for the purpose of this discussion, we can say that the sun is stationary. The earth is moving around the sun, not in a perfect circle, actually, but in um, a bit of uh, an ellipse. And yes, imagine that as the Earth goes around the sun, counterclockwise, if you're looking down on the whole system, down, um, can, orienting uh, up and down in line with the North Pole, is basically up and the South Pole is basically down. We're going to take a Northern Hemisphere centric view on this explanation. So imagine the Earth to be going counterclockwise around the Sun. Now imagine also that the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be more or less in line with the Earth and also going counterclockwise. So part of the deal, part of the design in this, is to try to remain as much as possible in the shadow of the Earth. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Fireside Tales for Wolfgang. You can view more of my work at Hunter's Acoustic Cabin. Directed by Hunter Ackerman. Produced by GWC Productions, in memory of Wolfgang Beastly. Originally broadcast on GWC Productions' YouTube channel, Caps Media Television Channel 6 in Ventura on KPPQ LP Ventura at 104.1 FM and on the KPPQ Podcast Network. Episodes can also be viewed on Pasadena Media, either on Spectrum Charter Channel 32, or on AT&T Uverse Channel 99.